when circumstances and difficulties and storms come into our life, option A is I can trust. And God says there's a supernatural peace produced by the Holy Spirit of his presence in me that will filter all of that and allow me to understand God's control and that will give me a supernatural, emotional, spiritual, and intellectual peace. Doesn't mean I'm happy, doesn't mean I like it, but there's peace. Option two is we can worry. We can become anxious. We can try and control the situation. And we can just literally get overwhelmed and paralyzed. I know God promises it, but how do you get it, okay? How could you move from anxious, difficult, painful, loss, tragedy, separation, divorce, cancer? And when you're in the midst of it, how in the world can you experience God's peace? The causes of anxiety are threefold. One, fear of the future, fear of failure, fear of terrorist attack, a fear of economic downturn, a fear that your kids won't turn out right, fear that your marriage is never going to get better, fear you'll be single the rest of your life, fear that you're never going to make it economically, fear, fear, fear of what if. Second is conflict in personal relationships. We dealt with this last week, but when there's a conflict in your marriage, conflict at work, conflict with one of your kids, conflict with your roommate, I mean, when there's conflict in here, a lot of it is the fear of it's never going to get better. And so that produces anxiety. And the third is regrets over the past. You know, there's, there's some of you in this room today that you have done some things in your past and you feel so bad about them that you rehearse them in your mind. And when difficult things happen or when things go bad, your mind goes to, I think God's punishing me. Or if anyone ever finds out about this and there's this anxiety or you view yourself as an unworthy person, not as a daughter of the living God, not as a son, a second class person. And so you feel insecure and anxious when you are in relationships. This is what anxiety does. In fact, the classical definition in Greek, literally, is a divided mind. In German, the word anxiety has a picture of being strangled. In other words, the circumstances are strangling you, literally choking out life from you. That's what anxiety does. And it does it psychologically, it does it emotionally, it actually does it physically. So listen, here's the impact of anxiety in our lives. Anxious individuals, lean back, okay, may be uh, hyper alert, irritable, fidgety, over dependent. They may talk too much. They may have difficult falling asleep. Their concentration may be impaired and their memory poor. They may be essentially immobilized by their anxiety. Some other symptoms uh, of anxiety are uh, headaches, quivering voice, sighing, uh, uh, respirations, episodes of hyperventilation, abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea. It gets worse. Butterflies, high blood pressure, rapid heart rate, fainting episodes, frequent urination, impotence, frigidity. Anxiety is the underlying cause, are you ready for this, of many psychological problems which include neurosis, psychosis, physio-psychological disorders, and phobias. Jot down Mark chapter 4, just, just put it down, I'll have you read it later, and Luke eight fourteen. Because yes, anxiety has huge mental, emotional, and physical implications that are difficult and painful and bad. And if, you're, if you hear me trying to build a case that you have to address this and you don't have to live this way, it's exactly what I'm doing. But this last one, Jesus talks to his disciples about how spiritual growth occurs. And he says that he's the sower of life in the kingdom of God. And he calls the word of God the seed. And he says, the seed falls on four kind of different paths that represent our heart condition. A hard path, a, uh, a one that's kind of filled with rocks. It's kind of not, not producive to growth. There's one that grows up that has thorns, and then there's one that's very productive. It's a good and honest heart. And he says, the heart that is filled with thorns, those thorns are the deceitfulness of riches, the cares of this world, and here's our word, anxiety, the worries of our world. Here's the question, how do you overcome anxiety? First Peter gives us this command, cast all your cares or anxieties upon him. And here's the reason, for he cares for you. As we talk about this, could I remind you that God is good, that he's your father, that he loves you, 
that he's in control, that he does not want you with stomach acid rolling. He doesn't want you up in the middle of the night. He doesn't want you medicating yourself like we do when we get anxious, you know, and you go to the refrigerator, and for some of you, it's a second or third or fourth glass of wine, and others, you know, little prescription drugs when your back still doesn't really hurt, and for some of you, you go shopping, you go out to eat, you spend money. I mean, we medicate our anxiety. I mean, billions of dollars every year in drugs to... Help us Americans with our anxiety. It says, do not be anxious about everything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Notice it says, nothing, literally, the, the word in the Greek text, it starts with, nothing be anxious about. And above that, get out your pen, and I want you to write negative command above that. Okay, it's a command. Nothing be anxious about, or literally, stop being anxious about anything. Stop being anxious about terrorist attacks. Stop being anxious about your finances. Stop being anxious about, you know, the big decision that's coming. Stop being anxious about how your kids are going to turn out. Stop being anxious if you're going to be, like, single the rest of your life. Stop being anxious if you're ever going to move up in your work. Stop being anxious. Stop it. I mean, it's a command. Now, I'll lighten up here just a minute, but if God gives us a command and we know it's for our good and we disobey God's command, what do we normally call that? Sin. And and by the way, that's not like some big guilt trip because, I mean, this is probably of all the sins that Christians, we commit on a regular basis, it's worry, it's to be anxious. And God says he commands you, stop worrying. And for some of you, you're thinking, man, I I would love to stop worrying. I just don't know how. You're going to learn how. But here's the deal. If you don't take this seriously, if you don't like say in your heart of hearts, you know what? This is a command. If God commands something, then there is power and ability to do what he says. Notice after that, then there's a positive command. But it's the strongest uh, word of contrast in the Greek New Testament. Stop anxiety, but in everything, by prayer, by petition, with thanksgiving, the request of you let be made known to God. I want you to write right above where it says, but everything, write positive command. So he's going to say, don't do that, but he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray about everything. Look at the very end. Notice it says, and the peace of God, surpassing all understanding, will guard the hearts of you and the thoughts or literally the minds of you in Christ Jesus. And right above where it says, and the peace of God, I want you to write the promise. So you should have negative command, positive command, and the promise. The promise is, if you will stop worrying and start praying in a very specific way, The promise is the kind of peace that's beyond human understanding God will give you. And notice this little line. It says, it will guard the hearts of you. The heart is the seat of affection. The heart is what's down deep. Often, when you go to bed and there's unresolved things, your heart and your mind are trying to resolve those things. And the reason we wake up at 1.11 and we look at the clock and it's 2.07, then it's 3.01, and then it's 4.17, and then we get up and say, wow, I'm, I'm sure glad I worried for the last four or five hours. I just feel refreshed. I just can't wait to take the day. In fact, the matter is we're exhausted. And, and so he's saying the heart is at the seat of affections. He says this peace isn't just something that will allow your intellect to be at rest. This is a peace that allows your heart to be at rest. And and then notice it says this peace is, it's almost, it's given a personality. It says the peace of God. It says, well, what? Guard. Put a circle around the word guard. It's a military term. Many, many years ago, I had the chance to uh, go to England and, you know, the big palace and you get the guards, you know, they got the big hat and you're like this, you know, right? They're doing this, and no matter what you do, man, they never break out. You know, they're, you know what they're called? They're called sentries. That's this word. And what a sentry does is you, it stands guard. It doesn't defend. It doesn't solve things. You stand guard, and, and a sentry says, oh, the enemy's coming. There's a problem, and it gets help. Listen carefully. 
the peace of God every believer possesses because the spirit of God is a spirit of love and joy and peace. And Jesus said he will give you his peace. You, you possess it. It is a guard in your heart and your life. And when you lose your peace, when you feel anxiety coming on, when you feel you're losing control, when you feel anxious and feel like you have to power up, when you feel like, oh, I've got to take care of this, you're losing your peace. The century, the spirit of God is saying something's wrong. When you're losing your peace, something's wrong. Deal with it. It's, it's like driving in your car, and as you're driving in your car, you know, one of those lights is flashing, and, you know, it's flashing. Well, the problem isn't the light. It's saying something under the hood. Stop and address it. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.